How do you find God up a mountain? Let me first tell you a story. On May the 5th, 1725, a Dutch sailor was convicted of sodomy and cast away on Ascension Island in the Atlantic Ocean. He kept a diary of his struggle to survive until October the 14th, after which it is assumed that he died. The following January, a passing ship found his belongings and diary, and this was published in English in 1728. On the 16th of June, the sailor first writes of hearing voices cursing and swearing outside his tent. He was surprised to recognise one of the voices as an intimate acquaintance. Thereafter, he details several interactions with spirits of people he knew. Of one, he writes, He haunts me so often that I begin to grow accustomed to him. Now these may be the ramblings of a man alone and undernourished, driven to drinking his own urine to survive, gradually losing his mind. Or they might be the earliest documented case of third man syndrome. Though, if you follow it through, we may find that the Old Testament provides some of the earliest examples of third man syndrome. Another story. In 1914, Ernest Shackleton set off to complete a crossing of the Antarctic continent by traversing 1,800 miles of largely unexplored land from the Weddell Sea to the Ross Sea. With Amundsen having conquered the South Pole, Shackleton saw this as the next great polar adventure. The fate of his trip is well known. Whilst he utterly failed in reaching his goal, his trip is remembered for the great feats of endurance of his crew. His ship, the very aptly named Endurance, had been built just two years earlier in Norway by experts in whaling and was constructed specifically to handle icy waters, with cross bracing everywhere for added strength. This all counted for naught when Endurance became trapped in moving ice in the Weddell Sea for around eight months before being crushed into kindling. The crew escaped and spent five further precarious months on deteriorating ice flows before three lifeboats were boarded and they made a nine-day trip in temperatures as low as minus 30 with little food and with regular soakings arriving eventually on Elephant Island. The state of the crew must have been shocking. Nine days after arriving on Elephant Island, knowing that they would never be discovered there, Shackleton and five others took one of the twenty-foot boats and made an incredibly perilous sixteen-day, eight-hundred-mile trip to South Georgia across the mountainous Southern Ocean. A quote from the book is worth adding here. At midnight I was at the tiller and suddenly noticed a line of clear sky between the south and southwest. I called to the other men that the sky was clearing, and then a moment later I realised that what I had seen was not a rift in the clouds, but the white crest of an enormous wave. During twenty-six years' experience of the ocean, in all its moods, I had not encountered a wave so gigantic. It was a mighty upheaval of the ocean, a thing quite apart from the big, white-capped seas that had been our tireless enemies for many days. I shouted, For God's sake, hold on! It's got us! Then came a moment of suspense that seemed drawn out into hours. White surged the foam of the breaking sea around us. We felt our boat lifted and flung forward like a cork in breaking surf. We were in a seething chaos of tortured water, but somehow the boat lived through it, half full of water, sagging to the dead weight and shuddering under the blow. We bailed with the energy of men fighting for life, flinging the water over the sides with every receptacle that came to our hands. And after ten minutes of uncertainty, we felt the boat renew her life beneath us. She floated again and ceased to lurch drunkenly, as though dazed by the attack of the sea. Earnestly, we hoped that never again would we encounter such a wave. Having arrived on South Georgia, an emaciated, exhausted and frost-bitten team of three, wearing the same worn-out clothing they had first donned eight months earlier, with just fifty feet of rope 
and an adze between them found their way across the unmapped island's four and a half thousand foot mountains and glaciers to reach the whaling station at Stromness. After surviving the bitter cold, improvising the route as they went, and finally descending through an icy waterfall, they arrived at the whaling station and presented themselves to an unbelieving station manager. You can emulate Shackleton today and retrace his steps across the 30 miles from King Huckan Bay to Stromness. With modern polar clothing, tents, all the latest gadgets and a map, you can spend two long days and a night following the route an emaciated, exhausted and poorly equipped Shackleton completed in 36 hours. The 22 men left on Elephant Island had to wait four and a half months huddled under their upturned boats before being finally rescued. In his report of the journey across South Georgia, Shackleton recalls, When I look back at those days, I have no doubt that Providence guided us, not only across those snow fields, but across the storm-white sea that separated Elephant Island from our landing place on South Georgia. I know that during that long and racking march of 36 hours over the unnamed mountains and glaciers of South Georgia, it seemed to me often that we were four, not three. I said nothing to my companions on the point, but afterwards Worsley said to me, Boss, I had a curious feeling on the march that there was another person with us. Crean confessed to the same idea. One feels the dearth of human words, the roughness of mortal speech in trying to describe things intangible. But a record of our journeys would be incomplete without a reference to a subject very near to our hearts. We are left to wonder where Providence was on the 17th of February 1911 when Edgar Evans fell and died on the Beardmore Glacier, or on March the 16th when Lawrence Oates, knowing that his frost-bitten feet might doom the team, walked out of the tent to his death, or over the next two weeks when Edward Wilson, Henry Bowers and Robert Falcon Scott slowly died of starvation, exhaustion and cold, just 11 miles from safety. Francis Sidney Smythe is perhaps someone that you've not heard of, and why should you have? Born into a privileged lifestyle in 1900, he studied electrical engineering and had short stints in the Royal Air Force and with Kodak, before combining his loves of mountaineering and botany with photography, writing and lecturing. He wrote almost 30 books about his trips to the Alps, Himalayas and Rockies, where Mount Smythe is named in his honour. He was involved in three attempts on Everest in the 30s. It was also in his book on the 1933 attempt, during which he got to within 1,000 feet of the summit, that Smythe recalls a curious incident. After leaving Eric, a strange feeling possessed me that I was accompanied by another. I have already mentioned a feeling of detachment in which it seemed as though I stood aside and watched myself. Once before, during a fall in the Dolomites, I had the same feeling, and it is not an uncommon experience with mountaineers who have had a long fall. It may be that the feeling that I was accompanied was due to this, which in its turn was due to a lack of oxygen, and the mental and physical stress of climbing alone at a great altitude. I do not offer this as an explanation, but merely as a suggestion. This presence was strong and friendly, in its company I could not feel lonely, neither could I come to any harm. It was always there to sustain me on my solitary climb up the snow-covered slabs. Now, as I halted and extracted some mint cake from my pocket, it was so near and so strong that instinctively I divided the mint into two halves and turned round with one half in my hand to offer it to my companion. Smythe went into more detail in the book by expedition leader Hugh Rutledge, titled Everest 1933, in which he wrote a chapter. All the time I was climbing alone, I felt I was accompanied by a second person. This feeling was so strong that it completely eliminated all loneliness I might otherwise have felt. It even seemed that I was tied to my companion by a rope, and that if I slipped, he would hold me. 
I remember constantly looking back over my shoulder, and once, when I stopped to try to eat some mink cake, I carefully divided it and turned round with one half in my hand. It was almost a shock to find no one to whom to give it. It seemed to me that this presence was a strong, helpful and friendly one, and it was not until Camp 6 was sighted that the link connecting me, as it seemed at the time, to the beyond was snapped, and although Shipton and the camp were but a few yards away, I suddenly felt alone. We are left in no doubt, not only that Smythe truly felt the presence of another person with him, but that he believed, felt, accepted, that he was actually roped to this person, and would be safe even if he should stumble. Again we are left to wonder why there was no companion to save the close to 1,000 people known to have died in the Himalayas in the last century, or the countless victims of mountaineering accident and misadventure around the world. It would appear that many people, pushed beyond the bounds of normal endurance, experience this third man syndrome. I discussed similar experiences in my World War I video on the Angel of Mons, why does it occur? There is speculation that it is a coping mechanism, the brain under extreme pressure creating a supportive presence. Of course, invariably the brain is not only under extreme pressure, but is also being deprived of the sugar, the brain consumes 25% of our sugar intake, and other vital nutrients and oxygen that are required for optimal performance. Altitude sickness is quite well understood and can put extreme, even fatal, pressure on the brain and heart. So third man syndrome might simply be the operations of a brain under extreme duress. In a barren or monotonous landscape, or with the mind focused on putting one foot in front of the other and nothing more, the brain, starved of nutrients, focuses on its primary evolutionary goal, survival. Perhaps, as the brain conserves energy, the normal communication between various brain centres shuts down and they become detached. Our sense of oneness breaks down. Our ever-rationalising brain tries to make sense of these normally unnoticed internal communications appearing to come from nowhere by creating a separate entity which it can accept as the originator of these communications. This last might be supported by the experiments on patients who have had their corpus callosum divided, as I detailed in a previous video. These patients, presented with the word face to their left visual field, will report seeing nothing, because the language center in their left hemisphere, taking inputs from their right visual field, sees nothing. Yet when asked to draw what they see in their left visual field with their left hand, they draw a face. However, they are unable to say what it is they have drawn until they view it with their right visual field. This idea is taken even further in Julian Jaynes' 1976 book The Origin of Consciousness in the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind, in which Jaynes argues that up until recently, possibly as late as 400 BCE, the experiences and memories of the right hemisphere of the brain were transmitted to the left hemisphere via auditory hallucinations. Jaynes uses Homer's Iliad and the early Old Testament books as evidence of a time when men appeared to themselves to be acting under the direction of some disembodied director, or God, and contrasts this with the Odyssey and later biblical texts such as Ecclesiastes, Ezra and Zechariah, which lack the prophetic visions and disembodied speeches of the earlier texts. This might seem, and indeed might be, far-fetched until you consider the patients who have suffered hemisphere deconnection and the way that they can be instructed to and carry out a task without being consciously aware of why they are complying with the instruction. Is the internal dialogue we all now maintain the remnant of this bicameral mind? It may be that Jane's took two and two and made five, but the more I try to understand my own brain's functions and research things such as the split brain phenomenon, the more seductive some aspects of his ideas become. Richard Dawkins said of Jane's work, it is one of those books that is either complete rubbish or a work of consummate genius, nothing in between. Probably the former, 
but I'm hedging my bets. Now those who want to impute religious or spiritual connotations to the phenomenon of third man syndrome might quickly do so, and I suppose it would be easy for them to explain away the unlikely appearance of far distant mothers and ghostly apparitions of deceased comrades in some way. And perhaps it does not matter to them that there is an obvious bias in the fact that we only ever receive reports from those who have survived these extremes of endurance. We would have to take it as read that none of the multitude who died ever experienced the comforting third man immediately prior to their demise. I am an unashamed materialist. If you cannot provide corroborating evidence for something supernatural, then it will never be more than an unsubstantiated claim to me. If you tell me you have personally experienced it, I am prepared to accept that you have, so long as you are prepared to accept that what you have experienced is not necessarily what actually occurred. And next time that you read the Bible stories of the patriarchs and others' interactions with gods and spirits, consider the circumstances under which these meetings took place. Often up a mountain, in the wilderness, at times of strife or famine, often under some duress. Perhaps some of these meetings might be explained by third man syndrome, if not by the bicameral mind. Thank you, as always, for watching. Music